All right, it's 20 after, so let's get going. We're going to talk today about uh, ACID in uh, distributed NoSQL specifically. So we're going to start out. Here we are again. You or me are starting a new project or refactor, and you've reached the point where you need to select a database. Uh, you take the blue pill and you stick with the databases that you've always known, and the story ends there. Believe what you want to believe about NoSQL. You take the red pill and you go down the NoSQL rabbit hole and see how deep it goes. There's a lot of reasons that most of us still take that blue pill over and over and over again. Uh, because maybe it's the right tool. Maybe that relational database that we've used for years is, is still the right tool for this next project. Or maybe it's because the corporation that we work for says we have to use this database. It's the only database we're allowed to use, so we have to use it. Or maybe it's because the last time that you researched NoSQL databases, you found them to be lacking in features and the community and whatever else. So you just sort of put them aside and said, ah, I'm not going to worry about that. Or maybe it's because you don't want to give up the expressiveness of the SQL language. And I'm not going to talk about that today, but I absolutely 100% agree with you on that. The SQL language is a tremendous language for working with data. And maybe it's because, this is what I want to talk about today, maybe it's because NoSQL databases, you, you heard or read some more, that they don't have ACID guarantees, specifically ACID transactions. So if they don't have transactions, how could it possibly be any good? Well, and the response from NoSQL advocates, you know, like myself, has been something like this. Don't try to bend the spoon. Don't treat NoSQL like it's relational. There is no spoon. You probably don't need a transaction as much as you think you do. Now, I think there's a lot of truth to that. It's not 100% of the story, but I'm going to talk about this today, and that there is some truth to this, that the reliance on transactions may not be as great as you think it is with different types of databases. But what if I told you that many popular NoSQL databases, distributed databases, have ACID transactions now and have had them for a while? So if you haven't looked into them, this might be a good time to look back into those. Today, I want to take you inside of a sparring program. I'm going to talk with you about what ACID means. We're going to talk about the challenges of implementing ACID in a NoSQL database, specifically a distributed NoSQL database. I'm going to cover the reasons why transactions may not be as big of a deal as you think, but I'm also going to show you what ACID means and how NoSQL databases have been working with ACID, what ACID means to NoSQL, and how they've been adding transactions to distributed NoSQL databases. I'm going to take a deep dive on one of them, Couchbase, because I think it's a really remarkable approach uh, that's different from uh, other approaches out there, and it's going to help demonstrate the trade-offs. And we're going to touch on other databases that do it. We're going to dive deep into Couchbase today. So we're going to learn the Kung Fu of ACID, Mr. Anderson. So these are questions I ask myself a lot. So I put them in a slide to remind me. Um, my name is Matthew Groves. I work as a developer advocate for Couchbase. I'm a Microsoft MVP, I'm a Pluralsight author, et cetera, et cetera. Most importantly, I'm a father of two and a husband. Um, I try to do uh, well at those jobs, uh, uh, but I'm, I, I fall short all the time. And, and I am at NDC Oslo, which I told you I'm really excited about being here. I do wanna point out right away, just to get this out of the way, that Couchbase is not CouchDB. They're not the same piece of software really at all. Uh, the, the name is kind of just a, a remnant of uh, long past history. So if you hear me talking about Couchbase, I am not talking about CouchDB and vice versa. This is my agenda for today. We're gonna talk about transactions and relational, just a, a review about what they mean and how they work and, and why they're so important. We're gonna spend a little bit of time talking about why NoSQL, hopefully, uh, some of the reasons for these, you, you've probably heard of them in the past, and we're going to just touch on them briefly as a refresher. And then we're going to dive into what actually ACID is and why is it so challenging and why is it so challenging with the distributed database. I've got a demo for you to walk you through a transaction to kind of show you the happy path as well as some of the edge cases. And at the end, I've got uh, a summary and some other resources for you to really dive deep into that rabbit hole if you want to. And if we have time for questions, I will take them here on the video. And I'm also uh, spend as much time as I need to in Slack, uh, NDC Slack, uh, answering questions as well. So let's 
talk about transactions in a relational database. And let's look at an example of a table here in a relational database. Now, third normal form is the way that we build schemas in relational databases. So even if you never heard that term before, you're, if you're using a relational database, you're probably designing with third normal form. Now, I'm not gonna go into all the details there, you may be even higher normal form like voice cod or fourth or even fifth in some really crazy situations. But just to review, third normal form is that it must be at least second normal form and then that must be at least first normal form. Now this table here on the screen is not even in first normal form. Uh, one of the reasons is we've, we've got this repeating group here of items. And intuitively, you probably see the issue with this, the problem with this. So, the first of which is, well, what if I want to buy more than three items? I don't have enough uh, columns in my table for that. So that's not a very good design for relational. But so a more correct design would be to split that shopping cart data into two tables. So each item gets its own row in a separate table. And there's a foreign key we introduce to point that row to the row it belongs to in the other table. So the solution to uh, Designing our data to be more correct and handle a, uh, you know, handle the use case better is to split it up into pieces. And th then this leads to why transactions are super important. So, if we want to create and save a new shopping cart to the database, we have to go through a number of steps. So, first of all, we have to insert a row into the shopping cart. So, I've just got like an ID and a date created. There could be other information in there, but a, a sort of a shopping cart container. We're going to insert one row into shopping cart items. So we're assuming that the user has maybe checked two items and they want to add those to a shopping cart. So we add a row to the shopping cart items table. Then there's another row in the shopping cart table to add another item in there. And then finally we say, okay, commit. We save that data. That's the shopping cart right now. The, the customer has added two items to the cart and, and we're, we're ready to go. Commit just tells the database, okay, we're done with this whole operation. It's all part of one thing. It's all atomic. So we're at the end of that, all right? Hopefully, hopefully you're familiar with that concept. Unfortunately, that's not always how things work. So let's try it again and see what happens. So uh, we're going to insert a row into shopping cart and there we go, the data's in shopping cart. We're gonna insert a row into shopping cart items next and oh, uh-oh, what happened? Oh, we have a blue screen, something crashed. Oh, something went wrong. Oh, this is bad, bad, bad. So we have a crash right in the middle of our transaction. We're trying to put this data into the database. So we've got a crash. Um, if this all takes place inside, so right now the data is in an inconsistent state. We've got a shopping cart, but none of the items that we wanted to add are there. If this takes place inside of a transaction, no problem. We can just roll back the transaction. Whew, we're safe. So it's just uh, either the whole thing happens or none of it happens. If the database itself crashed, that's not a problem. It wasn't actually committed. So the database doesn't consider it to be, uh, you know, committed data. It's not complete yet. If something else went wrong in our program, like an exception maybe, or something like that, we can detect that, catch that exception, and then explicitly call a rollback and bail out. No problem. Also, just want to point out, if we went back to the old single table way that I showed you, kind of that non-first normal form, uh, way of storing data. This wouldn't be a problem either. We wouldn't even need a transaction because there's just gonna be one insert. And so it either succeed or fail. There's no, no need for a transaction in that case. So we can roll back and we're safe. We're back to the data being consistent with what it was before we started the transaction. Okay, we're in good shape. Now, let's switch over to a NoSQL document database. Now in NoSQL document databases, data is not stored as rows in a table. The concept of rows and tables aren't there. Instead, we have individual pieces of JSON called documents. Now, on the screen here, we've got four different documents. Now, since my background is relational, um, it, that really is the case, my background is relational, I might try to do this in a document database. So maybe it's because I'm importing from a relational database where the data is split up like this already. Or maybe this is just because this is what I know. I'm just going to assume that it's going to work the same way in a document database. I'll just do it this way. And if you are thinking about this approach, and then you learn that NoSQL has oh, no acid transactions are available, well, then yeah, this is a problem. I'm no, I don't want to use this database. That's a problem. I can't do it. 
uh, so bail out and go back to what I know. But we aren't using tables anymore. We aren't using rows. There's nothing that says we have to put data into third normal form. In fact, since we're using JSON, we have support for arrays and nested objects in a single piece of data. So if I want to create a shopping cart and model it like this on the screen here, this now becomes a single operation on a single piece of data to create it and update it and add items to it. So voila, asset guarantees in a document database, as long as we're only working with one document at a time. So that's really what uh, advocates have been saying for a long time is that you don't necessarily need transactions as much with a NoSQL database because you can put your data into a single document instead of running it through a paper shredder and splitting it up to go into a relational database. So you don't need the equivalent of a transaction in this case. If you've read this book before, you've probably heard about this. I know uh, Jimmy Bogard mentioned it yesterday in his presentation. Uh, if you heard the concept of aggregate route before, this is basically that same modeling exercise. We draw a box around the shopping cart and all the different uh, pieces that go into that. But with a document database, we can push those all together into one single piece of data you know, if we want to. And that's kind of the same modeling exercise. I'm far from the first person to make this observation. So Martin Fowler created the term, uh, tried to coin the term aggregate oriented database as far back as 2012, about eight years ago. But it never really caught on, which is unfortunate because it's a much better way to describe a NoSQL document database. He used it, he applied it to both document and key value, which are kind of like cousins uh, in, the, in the database world. And so I think that's kind of the concept that you need to think about in terms of document databases. So let's talk about then why is NoSQL even being used? Why do companies use NoSQL? Why does why is NoSQL caught on? What are the why does it even exist in the first place? So some of these are my opinions, and uh, so just take them at, at that value. That this is these are my beliefs. I, I think the main reason that NoSQL kind of gained traction in the first place is scaling, which is something that's hard to do with systems that were designed to run on one machine and serve a relatively small number of operations. Suddenly, you expose those to the internet. And now that one big machine model becomes expensive or even impossible in some cases. And so what scaling actually means in practice to me, what distributed actually means to me and is not replication, but actually distributing data amongst multiple machines. So that data can be sharded uh, easily, uh, hopefully automatically, and that can be built in. And uh, that would be the, the way to scale a database in a distributed fashion. Now, in practice, this varies from solution to solution. So depending on which NoSQL solution you look at, they may not be designed for distribution, easy distribution out of the box. They may be designed for replication out of the box, but not necessarily distribution. So you may need to do a lot of extra work, like configure your own load balancer or uh, figure out how to do leader election, uh, define what your shards and your partitions are. Um, it also means that transactions, which is what I'm talking about today, become more difficult because you have multiple machines now. And so the network is now in play. And therefore, early on, this was one of the trade-offs. Well, we've got network in play that makes uh, atomicity hard, the atomic A in ACID. So we'll just trade that off. We just won't worry about that for now. We, we want to we distribute data. We want to have quick access to it. Transactions is something we'll have to, have to uh, deal with. High availability is another one. This is a huge benefit of a database that's designed to be distributed. Think back to that one big server model. So if that one big server goes down, the whole system goes down with it. But if you have multiple machines in a cluster, if one of them goes down, the remaining servers can recover and stay available. Again, in practice, depending on which solution you look at, this might involve having to set up your own sharding definitions, setting up your own replication processes, uh, something like Zookeeper, things like that in place to provide that, depending on your solution. You may not need to, you may need to. Performance is another big one. Every database, of course, claims superior performance, and they all publish benchmarks to back it up. Well, that can't possibly be true, of course. Um, we've already seen an example uh, earlier of data modeling uh, introducing a uh, a improved performance potentially because we've reduced the operations from say three or four 
down to one operation. And additionally, just to kind of throw something else into this, a lot of NoSQL systems, not all of them, but a lot of them introduce some memory first or memory only capabilities. So you don't have to wait on disk access uh, at all or as much. And so this also factors into ACID because we're, now we're talking about durability. If we're not saving to disk, we're not saving to disk right away. Is our system really durable? And finally, this is the one I think a lot of developers look at as uh, a positive or a negative, and, and a lot of DBAs look at as a positive or, or a negative, depending on who you talk to. Uh, data flexibility, in my opinion, was not really the, the primary goal of NoSQL to start with. It's just kind of a really nice side effect or trade-off, depending on who you ask. Uh, but a lot of people see this as really the main benefits of NoSQL, and, and who am I to argue with them? So each piece of data is isolated now because it needs to be able to live on its own on any one of the servers in our distributed architecture. So it can't depend on other pieces of data. So if that's the case, it may as well be in a format that's well understood and useful and easy to read like JSON. And by the way, JSON has parsing libraries and deserialization libraries for every language and platform underneath the sun. So that's a really good choice. Now I'm gonna focus on a document database today but another key tenet of NoSQL is the so-called polyglot persistence, using the right database for the right job. And especially in like a microservice type architecture where each service may have different data structure needs. So maybe one service needs graph, maybe one service needs time series, one service needs a document, which I'm gonna talk about today, uh, mobile synchronization, or maybe uh, one of them needs relational for that matter. You use the right database for the job. So I've touched on this already a little bit, but, but what, what are the challenges of ACID in distributed database? So I wanna do a quick review of ACID because sometimes this is just kind of glossed over as like, oh yeah, it's ACID or, oh yeah, it's not ACID. Well, ACID is a set of properties that was actually coined back in 1983. That's not when it first started, but that's when it was first coined, this term. It's not like, it's not a standard in the sense that if you get a couple of database people into a room, they're not, they're going to argue about what ACID means, right? It's not a hundred percent, um, you know, no, no one's going to have a hundred percent agreement on what it means. There's no ACID governing body or anything like that. There's a lot of nuance to it. So from my point of view, I don't think of it as a standard. I think of it as a, a way to start a conversation about databases and, and data and the trade-offs inherent. So I fully expect you to disagree with my characterization. That's totally fine. Um, but I do want to review ACID. Uh, a little bit here before we get into uh, transactions. So, A, an asset is for atomicity. This means that all operations succeed or fail together inside of a transaction. So think back to that shopping cart example. If you can model down to a single document, you have atomicity because you're only doing one operation. In relational, you need to do the equivalent of three operations or more. So that would be multiple, uh, a multiple uh, operation that you need to wrap in some sort of atomic transaction. So we can say at a single document level, a NoSQL database has atomicity already. C is for consistency. And, and from my point of view, this is maybe the most nebulous part of ACID. But again, let's think back to that shopping cart example again. If an operation cannot be rolled back, the data can then be placed in an inconsistent state. And there's other things that might fall into this category. So for instance, with a relational database, you can't put six columns into a five column table, right? So that's consistency constraint there. Uh, a NoSQL database requires JSON. So if you, if you can't put non-JSON format data into a JSON document, that's a kind of consistency. And then there's always this term you hear called eventual consistency. And this is kind of the scary thing sometimes. People hear about this and like, oh, that's, oh boy, my data is not gonna be saved or not gonna be saved in time. Well, this depends on a number of factors from database to database, and which, by the way, can also apply to relational databases. So, for instance, at Couchbase, there are multiple ways to interact with data. It's not just SQL. There's lots of ways you can interact with data. So you can use a key value operation to insert data. And if you do that and use a key value operation to retrieve the data, it's always going to get the latest data. So it's going to be strongly consistent. However, if you use a key value operation to insert data and then run a SQL query, 
that's going to have to go against the secondary index. And that secondary index uh, is updated asynchronously. So you may get stale data, you may get the latest, depending on um, the race conditions. And you can also set latency preferences there. So by default, it's going to be eventually consistent, but you can also say, I need stronger consistency than that. So for this operation, give me a stronger consistency. And I understand the trade-off in latency. It's going to take longer, potentially, to run that query. So if stale data is a concern for you, and sometimes it's not, not all use cases uh, worry about stale data, or you know, if it's a few seconds or milliseconds old, not a big deal. So just check to see if your database can, uh, you know, how that handles stale data, how that handles eventual consistency, because there may be some trade-offs there. Maybe it's a, a 80, 20 rule. 80% of the time, eventual consistency is fine. 20% of the time, I just need to go into my code and specify stronger consistency. And this is, by the way, true for relational databases. So we're going to look at isolation here to kind of see why isolation, isolation levels. This is the Jepson consistency models map. So there's, there's all different types of consistency. We're not going to go deep into this today, I promise, because it's, it's a lot to cover. Um, but there's different groups here. So pink are the models that are, are just not going to work. Oh, we've got uh, annotation request here. I don't know what that is. I'm going to decline that, sorry. Um, so anyway, so pink are the models that just won't work when there are some network failures. So you have to pause all nodes of the operation to make that level of safety happen. Orange is what's known as sticky. So it only works when clients get paired up with a server and they can't switch to new servers. Blue is the areas that are it's called total availability, which means it's possible even when you know, pieces of the network are partitioned off or, or servers are down. So for instance, uh, the way to read this is again, kind of like the normal forms. So uh, read uncommitted uh, and then have read committed. Read committed is stronger than read uncommitted. And read committed, you know, there's a lot to it, but basically it just means that dirty reads are not possible. So I'm not gonna be able to read data that's in the middle of a transaction. So, uh, and then monotonic, monotonic atomic view, that's a hard one to say. Um, monotonic atomic view, it's slightly stronger uh, than read committed. Now in Couchbase, for instance, that key value API that I mentioned, that can provide monotonic atomic view. So a stronger level than read committed. However, I, I'm not gonna say Couchbase is completely monotonic because there's other APIs. So I mentioned query, for instance, where it would be read committed. So it's a little bit in between. So even amongst all these complicated pieces, there's still even some more nuance there. Now you might look at this and say, oh, well, strict serializable, that's the best. It's at the top, it's the strongest, it must be the best, I'm going to use that. But there are trade-offs there. So if a node shuts down, if you're trying a distributed system, for instance, if a node shuts down, nobody else can do anything. There's a huge, and so you're basically just, it's down until you, know, you can get that system back up again. And there's a huge latency trade-off there. So this is actually rarely used, strict serializable. It, and it's basically, think of it as one operation at a time. That's kind of the simplest way to think about it. And so read committed, for instance, is the default for many relational databases as well. So definitely wanna, if you're interested in this, there's, uh, Jepson has a whole website around this uh, stuff. You can learn more about that. And I'll provide these links uh, towards the end as well. And uh, if you don't wanna write down the links or type them in yourself, uh, I will provide the slides for this as well with all, all the links in there. Uh, isolation is the next part of ACID. This is basically, in terms of transactions, this is about concurrency. So if a transaction is isolated, that means it should appear to leave the database in the same state as if the transactions were executed sequentially, as if it were strict serializable. Now, locking methods have been available in distributed databases for some time, but again, at the single document level. So you can still do a lock of a document, and so nothing else can read or write to it other than whatever has that lock. So for a, in an ACID transaction in distributed database, the transaction may involve locking multiple documents. So there must be a timeout associated with locks. Otherwise, a document could be locked in perpetuity. We don't want that. We want it to unlock eventually. So therefore, transactions have to be constrained to a timeout period. So the transaction has to finish within a certain amount of time. Otherwise, it automatically is, is just rolled back and, and done. <clears throat> 
And the last one is durability. And this is one that I think there's probably a lot of argument about uh, durability. Is my data durable? Uh, after my write operation, if the system crashes, will the data still be there? So traditionally, this has meant that, well, my data must be written to disk to be durable. But I think there's more to it than that. Because, you know, think about other things that could happen. What if the disk fails? So is that durable enough? If the disk fails, okay, well, then no big deal. Um, so maybe we need a replica to some other disk. So now we have two disks in the equation. So is two disks durable enough? Is three disks, et cetera? What if it's a memory only database? Does that mean it's not durable? Because, you know, if the machine powers off or resets or something, then it's just gone from memory and can't be recovered. Well, okay. So what if there's a copy in some other machine's memory? So we've got two copies in memory only. Is that durable? Is that durable enough? What about three machines, et cetera? And what if the whole data center goes down, right? What if Amazon East goes down? Is that durable? Is that not durable enough? Do we need multiple data centers? And so for all of these different levels of durability, there's a performance trade-off. Uh, and not only performance trade-off, but also the main thing here is that we may assume that the data is eventually written to disk or eventually replicated somewhere else, but do we check at the time that we do the write? And those checks are, is what adds the overhead. So do we check at all? Do we just fire and forget? Do we check to make sure it's been saved to one disk, to two disks, to two other machines' memory, to two other machines' memory and disk? So in, in NoSQL, typically what you do is you can specify the durability level on a per operation basis. The default being, you know, maybe fire and forget because it's the fastest, but we can specify increased durability settings if we need them. Um, so for instance, in a transaction to verify the durability, because that's very important. All right, so that's ACID. That's kind of my overview of ACID. There's, there's a lot more to it than that. That's, I think, the important thing to talk about with ACID transactions. So implementing ACID transactions is already challenging enough. But now we've got to factor in distributed systems, which means network. So here's some of the problems and some of the various ways to solve them or at least mitigate them. So the first one I want to talk about is split brain, also known as network problems. You know, if, if there's a crash or a network uh, partition or something like that happens, we've, that's a challenge for us. So first challenge, what happens if one or more of the machines in the cluster crashes? Uh, so this is absolutely a possibility. Hopefully it doesn't happen very often. Hopefully it's very rare, right? Um, our data center is pretty good. We're running in a cloud somewhere and uh, this isn't going to happen very often, but it's something that could eventually happen. So we need to plan for what's going to happen in that situation. And so the, one of the solutions or the approaches to this is consensus requirements. I just kind of touched on this with, with durability, but uh, how much persistence do we need is acceptable. Um, in terms of memory, in terms of disk, in terms of replicas, in terms of data centers, all those sorts of things are important to think about. Uh, and what about uh, transactions that get abandoned halfway through for one reason or another? We'll, we're going to see an example of this in my demo, but what happens uh, because they're going to leave behind some artifacts? Whether we're, you know, wherever we're implementing our transaction logic, there's going to be some artifacts that are left over. So what do we do about those? We can't just let them pile up. So there's a couple of different approaches to this. One of them I'm going to show you today is called the cooperative model. So basically it says any process that crashes, the next process that comes along is in charge of, is responsible for cleaning up after any messes that are left behind. There's other things like uh, Paxos. If you've heard of this before, I, I don't want to spend a lot of time on it because it's very, very complex. Uh, or something like a, a, another process, kind of a watchdog process or like a zookeeper sort of thing that is in charge of coordinating all these different transactions. Uh, edge cases is a huge problem. This is always something with uh, software in general, right? But uh, we could spend a lot of time addressing edge cases. What happens if the network cord comes unplugged at various times? Uh, T equals one millisecond, T equals two millisecond, et cetera. What happens when a node comes back online? What do we do then? Uh, what happens with uh, varying levels of network corruption or disk corruption? Uh, what happens when we set loose a chaos monkey 
to start just shutting down machines at random. And this is, again, this is still true for, edge, for relational databases, by the way. Uh, so I think really the only thing you can do with this approach is just try to mitigate and fix it as much as possible uh, to say, okay, yes, we're aware of this edge case. We're going to work to fix it. Or you can say, well, that's a one in a billion edge case, right? So the juice just isn't worth the squeeze there. We're going to let that one be an edge case that we're going to live with and accept it because it's, it's super, super rare. Latency is another thing to think about. So a, a lot of NoSQL databases, sort of their, one of their main things is we have to be really good performance. We have to be designed for better performance, low latency, because we're dealing with a, a huge number of users, a huge number of uh, requests and so on. So I think really the best approach here is that we're not trying to reinvent a relational database. Um, you know, uh, so what we should do then is we should try to educate here. And this is kind of what I'm trying to do in this presentation is just to say, we only need, only use acid when we absolutely need to. And, and so basically the kind of the other side of that is, well, how does acid transaction affect performance? How does it affect high availability? So we need to uh, understand that and think about that. So that way we know not to use, for instance, for instance, don't create a repository pattern and then wrap everything in a transaction just because, well, we may as well. We may as well put everything in a transaction because there's a huge performance trade-off there. So we need to use data modeling to solve that whenever possible. Like I mentioned, the aggregate route from earlier. Just try to combine everything as much as you can, as much as it makes sense to, so we can reduce the amount of transactions that we actually need. And correctness is also a huge problem uh, that we need to address. So once we've got an acid transaction in place, once we think we've got transactions working, we wanna make them available to developers to use. How do we know that they are uh, correct? Have you ever, let me ask you this. Normally I would ask you to raise your hands. Uh, you don't have to do this here. But if you, if you ever tried to write threaded code before and then tried to unit test that threaded code, it's a huge pain in the neck to do that, right? It's a, it's a whole problem domain in of itself. But now try introducing network into that equation as well. And so now it becomes very, very challenging. So once we've identified those edge cases, how do we verify them? How do we know for sure that we got all the edge cases? What about other edge cases we haven't thought of yet? I mean, that's just what, what we don't know what we don't know, right? So one thing we can do, and this, these aren't really solutions, they're kind of approaches, but we can we can try to apply Jepson guidelines. So Jepson has a huge, uh, I mean, that's their business basically to look at the transactions and determine, you know, uh, are these are these correct? Are these uh, are these uh, going to work correctly? And so this is a very this is a big challenge in and of itself. So it's this, this solution is also a challenge because Jepson testing is uh, very expensive. A if you want to hire Jepson, and it's, if you just want to follow their guidelines, it's a ton of work is a ton of work. So you, you might find yourself in the situation where, okay, you think you've, uh, you think you've got it tested and you think it's, uh, it meets their guidelines, but uh, Jepson themselves says, well, no, not, not quite. And, and I, don't wanna, I don't want you to take this as me diminishing a competitor here because all this shows is that it is a huge amount of work to get it correct. And it's very challenging. It's far from a completely solved problem. Uh, and so this is, itself probably the biggest challenge in, in uh, creating transactions in a database is making sure that it provides all the guarantees that you think it does. So I wanna talk about implementations now, how this is actually being done, the approaches that are being taken to, to, to create asset transactions in distributed databases. And I think there's kind of two main approaches to this. And um, this is where I think Couchbase diverges from, from other document databases, and I think is makes it very interesting to, to look at. So there's two approaches, server side and client side. So where do we put the transaction logic? Do we put it in the hands of the client that's actually uh, you know, submitting data to the server? Or do we put it in the server's hand and say, server, you handle all the transactions for us. And there's pros and cons to both approaches. Neither one is a perfect approach. So this is what I wanna show you is the different pros and cons. So the server side approach, we have the server do all the transaction work. So the server or the servers, I guess, because we're talking distributed database. 
we the, the main pro to this approach is that it's very light touch in terms of the SDKs. So uh, we don't have to change them very much. We're basically just relaying information from the client to the server and saying, okay, server, here's the transaction. You do all this work. Now, I don't want to diminish this because there's still real work to design SDKs, document them, et cetera. But the actual implementation doesn't live in the client. The cons of this approach is that we have to have some sort of global tool to manage uh, transactions, to sync the clocks, um, to do the scheduling. So this can be fragile in some situations, right? This could require additional configuration. It could have strict requirements about uh, your servers, for instance. So that's, that's the approach there, is now this is a lot of heavy work on the server side, and it's also can be fragile in some situations. The client side approach is kind of the flip side of that. So right away, we have none of those global things. We don't have to make any changes to the server, to the servers, to the, to the distributed cluster. It just looks like regular operational traffic. And now there are some server features that are needed, but none of them, are, none of the transaction logic will live on the server. So this makes it really quick to iterate. You don't have to wait on the server team to make a change and then update the SDK, for instance. And actually behind the scenes, uh, it was very cool to kind of see this in action, um, to see the, the client team at Couchbase and the server team at Couchbase working at the same time. And it wasn't like a, we're waiting for you, you have to do this, wait, wait, for, wait for you and go back and forth on that. It was very quick to iterate on that. And uh, nothing on the server has to be configured. So that's just kind of the flip side. As far as the servers are concerned, it's just regular traffic, nothing, nothing special. And the, but the cons here, there's, there's a pretty significant con to this. So each of the clients now need major changes because the transaction logic now lives in the SDKs. This is why my demo coming up here is, is going to be in Java. It's not because I love Java, I, I really don't, but it's just not ready yet in Couchbase for other languages. So all the SDKs must use the same algorithm to handle transactions. This makes it a little harder for the community, for instance. So let's say that someone wanted to build a Couchbase client in Fortran. I don't know why you'd want to, but let's say you're, you're a Fortran developer and you want to connect to Couchbase. So Couchbase does not have an official Fortran client. You know, we have clients for a lot of languages, but not, not Fortran. So if you want, you got to build your own Fortran SDK. Now, if you want to add transactions to the SDK, you have to now understand and follow the same algorithm that Couchbase has used in the other SDKs. Now, now Couchbase is going to do a lot of this work, right? Uh, all of the SDKs that Couchbase creates and supports are going to eventually have transactions in them, but it is a heavier lift to do this from the client side. Okay, now speaking of demo, it's time to get into a demo. So I wanna walk you through this process here and let me just uh, make sure this is on the screen there, okay? So I've got a Java program here that I've written and the source code for this will all be available, whoops, will all be available on GitHub and I'll give you that link in the slides and in the, in the chat room later if you wanna see that. But this demo just shows a transaction in action and we're gonna go through the different options here, uh, the different paths we can take. So this is a like, like a conference management um, data model here. So we've got a conference object, a conference document called NDC Oslo 2020. We've got a separate document that represents all the interactions between me, a speaker, and NDC Oslo, the conference. So things like submitting to the CFP, uh, doing the presentation, answering the questions on Slack, those are all interactions that are tracked here in my database. All right, Let me bring this up here. So. Let's go through this, these steps here. The first step is to connect to a Couchbase cluster. So this is just the normal kind of connection boilerplate. We're gonna to connect to a cluster by getting the address, the credentials and so on. I explained that data model already. Uh, so we're gonna create the initial sort of empty documents for that just ahead of time. And then uh, we're going to get into a transaction. So the first thing we do in Couchbase here is we create a transactions object. Now just by instantiating this object, just by saying, transactions create, we're gonna run a background process. That's going to be the cooperative model. That's gonna clean up any of the leftover artifacts from a crash. And you're gonna, we're gonna see that. And the other thing this is going to do is it's gonna create an object to create the actual transaction. 
So I've got a, just a wait for it, press enter here. I've got transactions dot run. And so inside transactions run, this is a Lambda. By the way, I'm not a Java developer. Um, I should have said this up front. Uh, I'm not. So anything that looks like hideous Java here is probably my fault. I'm, I'm just not super familiar with Java. But anything inside this transaction, uh, this run statement, this Lambda here, or whatever you call them in Java, that's going to be the actual transaction. I also wanted to point out the durability level up here. So I mentioned durability before, and I want to be able to set the durability level. So what's good enough durability to me? And each of these, so I'm starting with none here because my demo is just on the one server. I don't have a, a true distributed machine, so I don't need to worry about durability level here. But if I have multiple machines, I probably want to select one of these higher durability levels. Each one of these, as you can see the description here, has stronger and stronger requirements for durability but they also require more latency. So you have to think about well, which is, which, what do I really need? What do I want for this transaction? Okay. And then everything inside of here using the CTX, this will interact with the database. So I'm gonna get two documents from the database, one for the conference, one for the interactions, and I'm going to then update them. What I wanna do is update the conference document to say how many uh, follow-ups, how many uh, interactions, have been done for this conference by me, the speaker. So we're going to implement, uh, increment that by one because we're gonna add one to it. And we're gonna put the date of the last transaction there. So, you know, I could get these things via query, but what I'm doing is I'm just kind of rolling them up to a, a document so I don't have to run those expensive queries every time. You know, I just wanna see a big number at the top of the screen. Oh, you've had three interactions with this, uh, with this conference. And then I'm going to actually start putting uh, interactions in there. So this first one is me submitting to a CFP. We'll add another one later, delivering the presentation, and then Slack and so on. Once I've made those changes, I'm going to replace both documents using that CTX object, so those are both in the transaction. And at the very end here, I could say commit, but this is kind of implied, it's optional, because we're inside this Lambda. So we're going to assume if the Lambda runs successfully, that a commit uh, is going to, we're going to commit at the end. And we could also explicitly say rollback in here, we could say ctx.rollback, we're not going to do that here today. So let's, I'm going to go ahead and show you, here's my Couchbase database here running locally. Right now there are zero documents in it, no results. So I'm going to run this Java program here and it's going to wait for me to press enter. Okay, pressing enter and now program finishes over here in the database. I now have those two documents. So let's just look at them here. You can see I've got NDC Oslo and I've got one follow-up so far. And here's the date of that last interaction, that last follow-up. So we'll just copy this, this, uh, this integer here. And we'll look over here at the uh, interactions. This is going to have an events array. So every, of the, every one of those events, those interactions are gonna be listed here. Just make sure this date matches up. It does, okay, so there we go. We've got a transaction that created both of these documents in one atomic units. It's happy pass, so you didn't really see you know all the all the behind the scenes details there but also notice these other two pieces of kind of a transaction metadata here this is just one of the one of the pieces of the design pattern that's being used it's kind of a modified two-phase commit if you've heard of that before and these are just kind of our artifacts of that transaction that are in the database as well those don't actually contain anything right now at some point they did but it well, the transaction happens so fast we don't get to see that information so that's the happy path we're in good shape there, but uh, things aren't always happy as I showed you uh, earlier in the presentation. What if there's a blue screen right in the middle of the transaction? So I'm going to uncomment here this exception. Inside the transaction, we're gonna throw an exception. Uh, I'm also gonna change this to be, um, we're going to add a presentation interaction to this event, but I'm going to throw an exception. So we're gonna replace both documents, but then an exception happens, which means Anything that throws anything unhandled exception in this transaction is going to cause a rollback. So I just changed that. Let's run that code here. And um, I have to press enter again at some point. There we go. And you can see right here, maybe you can't see, but down here at the bottom it says, uh, attempt wrapped, it, wrapped exception, no retry. So it's emulating rollback, so transaction failed. And if I go back to my Couchbase database, retrieve these documents, 
Notice that it still says follow-ups one, still has the same date. And if I look in my interactions, still just has the one event. So even though I told Couchbase to update those pieces of data, that data got rolled back. Okay, so that's that's kind of uh, one of the edge cases we need to test for. Uh, a uh, That's a common one, actually, a, a rollback or an exception happening in the middle of a transaction. Now let's look at one that's a little bit more out on the edge. And this is one that hopefully doesn't happen very often, but it absolutely could happen. I'm going to set a breakpoint here right after the first document is being updated. But I'm not, not going to let the second document be updated. So I'm going to go ahead and run this program in debug mode here. Okay, got to press enter again to proceed. Okay, we've hit that breakpoint. I'm going to kill this Java program. So I've stopped the program completely right in the middle of a transaction. So let's see what happens when, when I do that. So I'm going to refresh my documents here. Look at my first document. It's not been updated yet. Follow-ups is still one. Last interaction is still the date. And of course, I never got to updating the interaction, so nothing's changed there. However, this is all happening client-side. So we need somewhere in the server to stage this data. If I go here and edit this and look at metadata, you can see I've got this metadata here, this X adder section that contains a lot of information that the transaction needs. But you can see here's the staged data right here. This is the data that's set to be replacing this document. It's still staged. So this means that the data staged, we kill it off halfway in between, so it's just stuck there in a staged, uh, a staged state. But we're not going to ever get dirty reads here because it has not been committed yet to that document. So the cooperative model says the next time this program runs, which I'll go ahead and run it now, when that transaction object is created, it's going to kick off a background process that will clean up that data. So this transactions, when I create this, I mentioned before, I don't know why this is showing over here, uh, that's going to kick off a background process that will clean it up. So I'm not even doing anything, I'm just, I just ran that transactions object. Now, right now, the time, the default timeout for that is 60 seconds. So after 60 seconds, this will say, okay, that needs to be cleaned up. And I can certainly adjust that to transactions to make them clean up faster uh, and so on. But the cooperative model says that more clients will come along and they will clean up any messes that happen that get left behind because of some crazy use case. So I don't know if you can see this on the, on the screen down there, but eventually you'll see a message down here that says, oh, I, I ran the cleanup operation and I cleaned up that data. So we're gonna give that some time to run there. If I go back here, notice that it's still staged, that, that, me that messy data is still there. It's not been committed, it's just staged. So we're gonna wait over here. Okay, we've got a transaction cleanup start run event. And so I think at this point, if I look at these again, that, that metadata, nope, not yet, not been cleaned up yet. We're still waiting for uh, the cleanup to finish. It does say here 60 seconds is the run length. So we have to wait a little longer for that. But any other processes that are accessing this data, the data is still consistent because it's, there's no dirty read possible. That's the read committed or the monotonic atomic view um, in action. Okay, we can wait a little longer for this to happen. Um, just to see the cooperative model in action. 60 seconds seems like forever when you're up here on stage. <laughs> it really does. But uh, it'll eventually happen uh, if, the, if the demo fates are with me. <laughs> I've practiced this a dozen times before and it worked fine. So eventually we should see the cleanup kick into place. There, okay, there we go. Let's try it again. Look at here and now the state is still here. Still not cooperating. All right, well, I think you get the idea. What you'd eventually see is that this uh, this X adders would become empty uh, because that it got cleaned up. Let's give it one more time here, see if it gets cleaned up. It's not cooperating with me today. Well, sorry about that, but uh, that's, <laughs> that's demos for you. That's live demos for you. Well, that's all I wanted to uh, show with the demo. So let's go back over to the slides. Just a quick summary of, of the trade-offs here. I've kind of um, gone through these already before, but uh, basically, asset transactions give you the ability 
to treat multiple operations as a single all or nothing. Use only when necessary. So I've, I've, I've said this multiple times. I think it's worth driving home. Don't use an asset transaction if you don't need to. Remember that there's overhead involved, and that's one of the reasons why you shouldn't use an asset transaction if you don't need to. So don't filter everything through a transaction just because it's convenient. Identify the areas that transactions are necessary and apply it there. Solve with data modeling when you can. So data modeling, if you aggregate things up into the aggregate routes, that's always going to be faster, more performance, and, and less overhead involved in a transaction to just model as one piece of data. But ultimately, don't be afraid to use a transaction when you need it. That's why there are tool, there are safety nets, but you know, don't just assume that, just design your data uh, to use transactions everywhere because it's, it's a safety net, it's not something you're, you're meant to just sort of lie in like a hammock. Okay, just to kind of go towards wrapping up here, transactions in NoSQL databases are basically on the cutting edge and they're still evolving. Now, what I just demoed for you uses the Couchbase key value access only. So you can start transactions, perform inserts, updates, and reads of single documents one at a time using their keys and then commit. If you're using Couchbase's query engine, which is SQL, by the way, Couchbase is a NoSQL database with SQL, uh, you're, you're not going to ever get a dirty read. However, you can't use SQL, at least not yet, to make changes in a transaction that can, that can be rolled back, right? So if you wanna do a mass update, like an update statement with Couchbase, that's not yet supported in a transaction Couchbase is currently working on that. That's a, another difficult problem to solve. Speaking of cutting edge, there are Couchbase is not the only one. There are other NoSQL transaction, uh, acid transaction efforts. So with uh, Mongo, it's not 100% clear on, on what they're actually doing for a transaction. Uh, some various videos and papers suggest that uh, some of the things involved are timestamping operations with like Lampert clocks, if you heard of those. Um, so the, again, back to the server side problem there, you have to make sure that your servers are uh, really perfectly synchronized. Otherwise it's going to be a problem. Uh, gossiping is another part of their, um, of their uh, solution to disseminate data, to, to replicate transactions. So there's a white paper there. If you wanna really go deep in the rabbit hole, definitely check out that ACM white paper there. But this is most other, those SQL databases that I've researched are all doing it server side and Couchbase is taking a different tack and saying, let's do it client side. And uh, by the way, I, I think I mentioned this earlier, but if you want links, this is a hard link to kind of write down and type in. So if you want those links, I will have the slides available in the Slack channel right after the presentation. So those will all be available for you there. Cosmos DB from Microsoft is another one that they used to only support transactions inside of a stored procedure. Um, but now, as I said, NoSQL continues to mature and you can use it, what's called a transaction batch, which was introduced this year. So you can write a transaction in your client code. Now, I still believe that it's server side, um, it's still being implemented on the server side. Uh, there are some limitations of transaction batch. Some of them are very, very reasonable. Uh, so uh, you have to uh, you limit to one partition key, which is kind of how Cosmos groups its data together to spread workload around. So that transaction has to be limited to just that partition. So that could be tricky. Uh, the other things like uh, two megabytes, five second and hundred ops limits, those seem extremely reasonable to me. And that just kind of reinforces the recommendation that don't use an asset transaction unless you have to. Uh, and there's a link to more information about how that works there. Again, not a really easy link to type in, but uh, available in the slides. One other thing I thought I'd bring up is a cockroach DB. Now this is a relational database, but it is distributed. Um, so it's an important example because we already showed that transactions are extremely important for relational databases. And uh, Calcroach is not a NoSQL database. It's called it's so-called so NewSQL, but I think it's worth bringing up. So this is kind of like Google Spanner, if you've heard of that before. So some work that Eric Brewer's done on that. This is, again, a server-side implementation because they wanted to be compatible with Postgres drivers. And so the only way they could do that on the client side is if they went out to every Postgres driver in the world and said, okay, we're going to give you CockroachDB um, transaction implementation. Uh, or you have to use the official Cockroach Postgres driver. So they had to do it all on server-side. Again, we have the clock syncing problem. If the clock skews outside of a limit, the database could just stop. Uh, that's going to hurt availability. 
Now, if you're using their cloud offering, this may not be as big of an issue because they're the ones that are managing the clocks and the concerns and all of that. But if you're running on your own data center, you have to really be concerned about that. There's a YouTube video here that talks about cockroach transactions. Uh, and specifically at 13 minutes, 42 seconds, that's where the, the transaction discussion starts. In that one. All right. Now, they say you only remember three or four things from any given presentation vis-a-vis. -vis. So here they are, Neo. The first one is that you may not need transactions in a NoSQL setting as much as you do in a relational setting. So the answer may be aggregation and not trying to take the exact same approach as you do with relational. NoSQL is maturing. This session has been about the rise of ACID transactions in NoSQL, but there have been tremendous advances in other areas like security, integration, reporting, analytics, deployment, et cetera. So if you've dismissed NoSQL in the past as being you know, not mature enough or not prime time, we're, we're in at least the second, if not third generation of NoSQL at this point. So it's worth a second look. The answer to why NoSQL continues to expand, the reasons that it exists in the first place still apply. Trade-offs to increase scalability, high availability, and flexibility. But now that NoSQL is maturing, the answer is expanding. High availability, scalability, flexibility, they're all still there, even when you need some ACID transaction capability. So here's some rabbit hole for you, some more rabbit hole to follow. Jepson has a lot of material on consistency. You definitely want to check that out. Uh, Graham Popel, he's one of the uh, engineers that was instrumental in uh, transactions here at Couchbase. He's got a, a full video if you want to dive deep into that. I myself wrote an ACID blog post a while ago before Couchbase had transactions that just talks about ACID and each individual part and, and specifically ACID with NoSQL. Uh, benchmarks are there. Couchbase publishes a huge amount of benchmarks. This link goes to the transaction portion of the benchmarks. So you can kind of see the trade-off there that, again, to emphasize, uh, only use ACID when you need to because there is a performance trade-off there. Uh, some white papers there uh, on uh, high availability transactions and uh, transaction design. You can, of course, take a screenshot of these, but I'm also going to share the slides in the Slack channel. So let's continue that conversation. These are the ways you can reach out to me um, on Twitter. I, I'd live stream on Twitch, do some live coding. I, I call it office hours. You're welcome to come to my office. Uh, I'm not streaming today because this is, I'm doing NDC Oslo instead, but normally I stream twice a week on Tuesday and Thursday. My email address is there. Conference room six is where I'll be in the NDC Oslo Slack. If you want to check out this, my LAN attempt at Java coding, see the transaction, you can go find it on GitHub there. There's that link. Okay, uh, that's all I've got. Thank you very much, everybody, for uh, for coming to my session. I appreciate it. Uh, it's great to see some of your faces during the presentation. I know this is a weird time and everything, but we may have a couple minutes for questions now if anyone has one.